Hello, everybody, and welcome to this session on Fostering Sustainable Capitalism to Mitigate Climate Change. Uh, we have some very big questions to be answering this morning. The global pandemic and the increasingly severe climate events have brought some serious urgency to how do we make our societies really sustainable? How do we make our economies really sustainable? How can business and political leaders undertake this massive reorientation and undertake it in the, at the scale and in the time frame that we need? How do we create a, a truly sustainable capitalism? As we're doing this, and as we're dealing with the climate emergency, how do we simultaneously deal with the nature emergency? And how do we make sure that the steps that we're taking to deal with climate don't inadvertently exacerbate the nature crisis, which is a crisis on fully on a par with what's happening with climate change? How do we implement, design and implement the green new deals that everyone is talking about to rebuild economies and societies for a global, and fully sustainable and carbon-free future? These are massive questions that we're addressing today. I'm Anne Florini, a professor at the Thunderbird School of Global Management, part of Arizona State University. I'm speaking to you from Washington, DC, and I am honored to be moderating today's session with three, with four very illustrious panelists. Um, our first panelist who will be speaking to us via video is Ricardo Serrao Santos, who's Minister of the Sea in Portugal. He'll be speaking to us in just a moment. Uh, Bo Inga Anderson, who is president and founder of Ivanhoe 4 in the US. David de Rothschild, who is founder of Voice for Nature in the United Kingdom. And Priti Sinha, the executive secretary of the United Nations Capital Development Fund. Uh, it is my great pleasure now to call on Minister Ricardo Sarau to join us. With the last pandemic, COVID-19, the resilience of humanity was again challenge, showing how global and interconnected we are. Today, uh, we celebrate the World Ocean Day, a day to remind us that the ocean is key to our life on the planet, to the life of so many species and ecosystems, and indeed to the planet as we know it. The ocean is a key contributor to solve major problems, including pollution and poverty. It gives, it gives us life and feeds us. And this is recognized in the United Nations Agenda 2030 with Sustainable Development Goal 14 in this set 20 to the Portuguese government. As a country, Portugal was shaped by the ocean since its early days. Ancient civilization traded at our ports, the maritime routes shaped our history, and we have one of the largest, largest maritime space in Europe. 2021, we continue to push forward the ocean agenda. Portugal has just approved its national strategy for the sea, 2021-2030. It is moving onward with the seamans of the Portuguese presidency of the Council of the European Union. It is strongly involved in numerous international negotiations and processes, including in the areas of marine biodiversity protection or in the United Nations decade of ocean science for sustainable development. We are also one of the 14 member countries of the high-level panel for a sustainable ocean economy, supporting the role of the ocean as a critical part of the solution for environmental recovery and sustainable economy. We will hold the ministerial meeting of the OSPAR Convention and next year we will host co-organized with Kenya, the United Nations Ocean Conference in Lisbon. In fact, I would uh, uh, take this opportunity to invite you all to get involved in the conference, as we all get together all stakeholders, private sector, public sector, business, NGOs, views, and everyone engaged with the ocean. The conference is one of the milestones of the decade of action for the Sustainable Development Goals. 
launched by the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres. This is our compromise to take action for the ocean together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister, for those profoundly important comments. Um, in addition to being a minister and formerly a member of the European Parliament, the minister is an accomplished academic who has a doctorate in biology and animal ecology and several hundred publications. So he truly knows whereof he speaks in informing us about the importance of the oceans. And speaking personally, I am really delighted to see that the oceans are beginning to get the kind of attention that they have long since deserved. They have been too much in the background of our policymaking and our business practices for too long. And it is very important that uh, we follow up on the points that he was making. So with that, let me now turn to Bo Inga Anderson, who is president and founder of Ivanhoe 4, which is a global investment company. Throughout his nearly 35 year career, he has served as president and CEO of Yazaki North America and Europe, president of Russia's two largest automobile companies, and he led General Motors global purchasing and supply chain functions and was part of the General Motors corporate leadership. That's an extraordinary, extraordinarily strong and diverse background in the automobile industry. And we know that transportation is a fundamental part of the sustainability challenge. Do we know the size of the problem? So thank you, Anne, and, and thank you for Frank Richter to uh, give me the opportunity to participate today. I think there are three questions we can ask ourselves. So first, do we know the size of the problem? I think it's rather clear that we have 1.4 billion cars in the world today and they stand for 21% of the CO2 emissions. And that's a big problem. When you look at the 1.4 billion cars, if we are nice, you can say that 10, billion, 10, million, 10 million of them are electrical. It's not 100% clear. So I think that's the size of the problem. Secondly, do we have technical solutions? I would say yes. Today, as consumers, we can select from more than 400 different car models that are either full electric or, or hybrid. And the important thing is that helping us to reduce emissions with more than 50%. In the Paris Agreement, the target is to reduce emissions 55% from the starting point of 1990. When you look at the technical solutions, unfortunately, they are not affordable. It's very expensive. And for most car makers, they are not very profitable. If you're a good car maker, you maybe make 10% operating profit or 10, 12% return on capital. So when you look at it, it's important to continue to introduce technologies that are affordable. And last, what is the role of governments? I would say governments must play five roles. First, they need to continue to set aggressive targets and stick to them. Secondly, in Europe, we have a penalty if you have more than 95 grams of emissions, and that means that the car company needs to pay to EU. We should continue that. Third, it's important to support end users to get subsidies when you buy an electrical car. Fourth, we need more local made batteries and fifth, we need charging stations. So in summary, we know the problem, we have a solution, it's not going to be easy and we need to play together. And I have a thousand questions for you given your, your vast supplier experience. Um, many of them having to do with autonomous vehicles and the transformation of the industry and et cetera, et cetera. What do you see the biggest obstacles to a real transformation of the industry? How do we overcome and how do we overcome those? First, we, we need to take the climate situation as very serious. Secondly, it's also very clear that people want to have more mobility. And if you take China, today there are roughly 200 cars on 1,000 people. And when you compare that with the United States, there are close to 800 cars per 1,000 people. So I think we will continue to see growth of transportation. No one is willing to give up the luxury of being moving themselves. So the technology transfer is important. But I also say that people need to make money. 
why should you be an automotive and investing billions of billions if you don't have any return? So three things, Anne. Continue to say climate is important. Secondly, give people the opportunity to move themselves. And third, keep automotive business as a profitable business. And juggling all three of those at the heart at the same time is going to be quite a challenge for policymakers and for the private sector. David, nothing, me, nothing is easy. Nothing is easy. Um, David, let me move to you briefly. So you were founded in 2006, the Voice for Nature Foundation, um, Correct. Yeah. doing some really fascinating things in there about innovative storytelling and helping people to understand what it actually means and to incorporate it into their own lives. You've reached out to children in classrooms, world leaders, you've hosted conferences, delivered keynotes, published books. You produced a Sundance Channel TV series, which I'd love to hear more about, um, a National Geographic documentary. You featured in a recent CNN series on modern explorers. And much of your work has really been working with the business sector, as I understand it, and with capital markets and others trying to figure out how do we take this understanding, this growing understanding that humanity is utterly dependent on nature, yeah. understand that we have badly misused the services that Mother Nature supplies and put these pieces together? And wh what is happening in the markets and where do you see this going? And we have temporarily lost David. I hope he is going to be able to come back and join us in just a second. So while we're trying to get David back, um, Preeti, let me turn to you then and introduce you briefly. So you bring 30 years of global experience. This is a very experienced panel we have here, um, spanning investment and development finance. You were the CEO and president of um, Financing for Development Limited which in Geneva, which focused in part on financing for the Sustainable Development Goals. And you are now executive secretary for the UN Capital Markets, um, where you're going to be, according to the list I was given, basically doing an enormous range of responsibilities. I wonder if you could talk with us a little bit about... Uh, I'm back. The, yeah, we'll get right back to you in a minute. I've just... Oh, I've moved on to you. Um, Beauty, I wonder if you could talk with us a little bit about what you have talked about in terms of human development and capital markets and sustainability. How do these pieces fit together? Sure, Anne. And uh, would you like me to go now or would we yes, go back? Yes, please. Go ahead. So thank you for this opportunity and thanks to Horasis. Lovely to be here. So as you said, uh, I'm running the UN uh, Capital Development Fund, UNCDF. And in that context, we serve the 46 least developed countries. So really uh, the last frontier of development, pre-frontier markets as we call them. So it's a wonderful uh, opportunity to discover with these countries how we can change capital markets and the perception of what should be valued in the capital markets. So my basic thesis is that capital should serve humanity. You know, and we need to uh, take the example now of COVID. COVID is something that cuts across all boundaries, all geographies, all classes. So in that sense, we must consider the world as one. And we must ensure that to go forward, the world needs to be healthy and equal and the capital needs to be invested across countries. So I want to achieve basic standard of living for all in every country. So the way I'm thinking of human development is kind of the idea of human development tokens. And this comes from a series of work that have been done before. So if you take the early example of social impact bonds, let's take educate girls, right? In that case, a investor puts up money uh, that is then uh, used to produce results, uh, getting girls in school, and then a philanthropy or a local government pays it back based on returns achieved, on the results achieved. The returns are based on the results achieved. Now, this has been taken a step further by uh, Credit Suisse issuing a rhino bond, a 50 million rhino bond into the market where people bought it. It's a five year bond and um, you get returns based on the number of rhinos uh, preserved and increased. So let's say, for example, I don't have the exact figures, but 2,300 current rhinos. If the rhinos increase to 3,000, then in five years, you'll get 5% return on your money. And if they go up to 5,000, you get um, more returns. Now, this is still, the returns are still being paid by Jeff, in this case, the Global Environment uh, Fund. So it's still a bit philanthropic. 
So my idea on the human development tokens is to make it completely market based and to consider the concept of a share in the ownership of an asset and not perhaps a bond. So in this case um let's take uh, let since it's on uh, sustainable um, development here let's take the provision of energy to a community right i think energy and everything that it brings with it uh, renewable energy in this case uh, should be kind of one of the human rights you know everybody needs access to energy to live a, a life so can that investment proposition let's say takes 50 million to uh, give energy to a large community can that be an investable uh quantifiable amount um and that investors buy kind of a token in it borrowing the tokenization concept from blockchain using or not using blockchain but the concept of tokenization is a fractal ownership of a uh, a bigger quantity and the fact that that value that token you hold has the value of your investment as it goes in so it's not charity and then the next year depending on the results achieved in delivering energy renewable energy to these communities the value of your token goes up so it's a market based uh, derivation um, and increase in asset value and the tokens should be tradable so again if somebody needs to buy renewable tokens then they could buy that from the current owner so this is the concept of the human development tokens that i'd like to bring into the capital markets uh, just as we start to think differently what money can do differently so we must try to quantify and create uh, investable opportunities around human development and related of course also to planetary development thanks and thank you one of the things that has really struck me is uh, in listening to you but also in other conversations with many others over the last couple of years is how much creativity is going on in thinking about using financial mechanisms to deal with the sustainability crisis Uh, this whole question about how do we value what do we value how do we turn it into markets but how do we ensure that as we're turning it into markets we keep the focus on sustainability so i'm thinking of things like uh, rob chami's work at the imf with various colleagues on valuing the ecosystem services that keystone species provide um, keeping a great whale alive gives you a couple million dollars in quantifiable carbon benefits um, how do we how do we do more of this and with that david let me turn back to you because you've been yes, working sorry, on sorry about that <laughs> it happens with the technology so yeah. what do you see happening and what do you think should be happening with capital markets with financing generally well i think what building off what previous just said i think this is this is where it becomes very exciting where we start to actually use you know components of the capital markets and and apply them to new ways of thinking and, and new mechanisms and new levers and and that can create you know different types of motivation i mean i think the thing that's very very clear to me is we've got a very short runway we've got a very heavy plane full of a lot of cargo and a lot of people and we've got to figure out how to land and are we going to run out of runway that's nature and we keep on cutting it back so we're losing more runway right um we keep on you know running out of we're running you know our crew is also dying that's nature right so we're sitting on this plane and the crew's you know falling over and we're still sitting there going ding dong i can't get any wifi oh my chair doesn't go back or can i get some more peanuts or you know we, oh the view's great and the movie's great and so we're highly distracted but we haven't quite recognized that you know there is about to be a crash landing of a major scale and what we need to do is cut back on a lot of these narratives that distract us from actually adapting and moving forward. And so I think when we see what's required from a capital investment standpoint, we we really have a monumental task. But there's some really low hanging fruit. If we were to take the subsidies that the IMF is projected go every year into the fossil fuel industry and we put that directly into PG scheme, we're talking around 5 trillion dollars a year. Think about that. right there is your capital because the clarion call that we get from adaption is well the cost is enormous but what is the cost of hundreds of millions of people being displaced because of rising sea levels what is the cost of these hard borders on lives and on children and on families who get separated it's immeasurable and so we have to start this adaption now the thing that scares me right now in the capital markets is that ESG 
is become a label of adaption with no accountability. It's very easy to say that I am an ESG based fund and that we are going to focus on generally, it seems to be environment, right? Uh, it's gone from CSR, I should say. And now we've gone, brilliant. What are we going to do? We're going to call it ESG. <laughs> and there's very little transparency. There's very little cohesion around actually like quantifying who's doing what, how they're doing it, how they're applying it. And the thing that always gets me are these forward facing, massively long term announcements. So we say by 2050, we're going to do the following. Well, I think one thing that is absolutely certain, the person who made that statement will be nowhere near that company in 2050. So the accountability is diminished when you have that runway. You can say, oh, don't worry, we'll figure it out as a company in 20, 30 years time. When we know today, absolutely categorically, that we need to invest heavily into systems, heavily into infrastructure, heavily into equality, heavily you know, in terms of access to water, access to sanitation, access to the list goes on, right? Because right now what we tend to do is we can see that there's a narrative that says, oh, here's something fresh. We can turn it into a product in the capital markets that we can then charge a premium on, that we can use as a marketing tool. And I would say the biggest um, thing that irks me is we see people taking all the great work from the UN, taking the SDGs and just slapping them on their website. And people don't even look beyond that. And they go, well, they've got an SDG logo on their website. They must be a good company. Right. So there has to be a lot more transparency, a lot more adaption and, and building on the token concept. I've been thinking about this idea of nature tokens and obviously, again, using blockchain as a way to um, actually create land titles, secured land titles so we can understand who owns what land. This is a massive problem in developing countries, massive problem for exploitation of resources, especially in South America, Central America, Africa, Indonesia with open pit mines or deforestation, etc. So if we can start to map the planet uh, and, and start to look at where the land is owned, where the indigenous conversation is around that, the original custodians, the, the locked in value of nature, right? And we can start to combine that. And then we can also on the other side start to say, and this is maybe a bit of a radical thing to say, and every, you know, on everyone's lips and moments is inflation, but a radical thing says, we can write trillions of dollars of checks today for COVID, but we're not writing trillions of dollars of checks for nature and survival. So who do we pay back when the system collapses? That would be the question. Everyone. Who do we pay back? So why can't we write a hundred trillion dollar species survival fund that we just agree upon? We say it's, it's sitting on the side and then we go to Bo and his industry and we say we know that for the for, to go from 10 million to 100 million vehicles, there is so much infrastructure and capital requirements that it cannot happen possibly with inside of the market system because it will not give any reprieve from a dividend that needs to be paid, which means that we have to follow the investment train. We have to follow the capital return that's short term because we're put under pressure. But if we said you as a company can transition, we'll lock your share price, we'll pay a reduced dividend now out of this survival species fund to shareholders so they don't put pressure on and we'll allow you to do the transitioning. You understand vehicles, you understand mobility, we'll give you the capital to do that as long as it creates the following jobs you write the business plan and we'll help you transition and we'll pull down from this market fund and obviously you have to be careful of hyperinflation and so on so anyway like i'll shut up but i guess the idea is there are new systems of thinking if we just focus on esg and think that these you know these new funds that are starting and these new capital conversations in the marketplace are going to save the planet then we're, we're we're running into a dead wall unless we get a lot more transparency and accountability anyway i'll be <laughs> I'll back on my I think you've oh every every issue that we need to talk about in, in the remaining 20 minutes or so, in which time we will save the world. Um, but I'm fascinated by this idea of massive capital is the thing that will break the locked in systems. I mean, we, we have systems for transportation, for capital markets, for, oh, we could go through the whole list, food, water, all of the rest of it. And they are locked into an equilibrium that we know is not sustainable and is not healthy. And we're all trying to figure out how we get out of this. Um, this is not primarily anybody's fault, although there are certainly vested interests that don't really want things to change. But mostly this is a systemic problem of how do we bring about an abrupt change because you're right about the runway being so short. Um, but let me get back to you. Is lack of capital the biggest problem or 
are there other things that need to change if we're going to, within five years, get everybody into electric vehicles? How do you bring about that kind of systemic transformation? So first, Anne, I, I pick up on one of the things that David said is, I have no aspiration to become a politician, but to sit around and say, we will decide that we will have zero emissions 2050 doesn't sound to do a right job, right? If you're brave, you say that in the next 12 months, I want to see this change. And I checked if EU charged the automakers in Europe any penalty for not fulfilling the targets last year. I couldn't find it. And then it was written somewhat loosely, and they said, if the OEMs will not fulfill the targets that were set in 2018, the maximum penalty could be 40 billion euros. And one of the big players would be faced with 10 billion, and that is roughly the yearly net income for this company. So I don't think money is a problem. I think we need to be more decisive what is important and when do we start and there will always be consequences. It can be benefits or it can be penalty. You need to have carrot and stick. So maybe I'm too dramatic, but that's my role in this life. Good. Um, let me follow up on that a little bit by saying one of the things that brings that could bring about very substantial change is if uh, the automobile industry sees that the existing fossil fuel industry is not going to be around all that much longer in its current form, that it's really under challenge. And certainly in the past month, we have seen some very dramatic developments happening at some very, very large oil and gas firms. We're seeing that uh, the world's major central banks have come together in a network for greening the financial system. We're seeing the G20 and others picking up this question of how do we fundamentally change what capital invests in? Um, so from both sides, we're seeing real pressures on our existing models. Is that likely to have much influence on how quickly we make a transition? Or is this just the usual kind of corporate turnover? What's going to happen to the fossil fuel industry? I'm, I'm, I'm happy to jump in a little bit on that and start some of that. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I think um, it's inevitable that we have to see a transition. Um, it's inevitable, right? I mean, I think we, you know, but I think it comes from leadership. This is what this is. This is, you know, the carrot conversation. Um, but we need we need real leadership, right? We need we, we don't need to continue to pay lip service and say, well, we will, and this and that, you know, we need someone who says, no, it's going to be uncomfortable today. It's going to be, you know, a transitionary period, but I'm going to be brave enough to take that and make that choice. And so when these companies, when the fossil fuel industry, if, if as I said earlier, if they stop subsidizing it, um, you know, with direct subsidies and stops, you know, the, the, the impact, the cost, right, of continuing along this path, if we could just take that out and then you start to look at the pressures and you start to say, well, you understand energy. So become an energy company, right? We all need energy. Access to energy poverty is a massive issue, but let's use smart energy. Let's transition to a grid that is smart. We've got the technology. We've got the capability. We've got, and it starts a, a revolution. It, it, jobs, engineers, training, you know, the new energy centers. I mean, look at the Sahara sitting above Africa. That could become the energy belt of the world, the center of the world, where you feed Africa to become the solar continent, and then you export to Europe. Think about those infrastructure jobs. Think about the transition. Yet what we do is we, you know, we subsidize these companies that are pumping out misinformation continually, continually down a path of exploration of, of oil, now looking at the deep oceans. It's World Ocean Day today, so we should all be grateful for the ocean, um, as the minister said. But we still look at the ocean and natural environments for exploitation. We're still looking at these things under this old world. We take, you know, the, the bigger the sinner, the bigger the saint in marketing, right? We've seen all these ads, like we're all working in this together. But actually, when you look at the impact of the fossil fuel industry, look at the misinformation and look at how much toxicity sits around that, you know, we have to change the narrative. We have to change the system. And, and that comes from accountability. But when you look at what just happened with Exxon, Right. And you look at engine number one, who only owns 0.02% of the stock. Right. And you look at what they managed to do, removing 
shareholders, activist capital is going to start, this model is going to be replicated. So if you can, if you're sitting there as an oil and fossil fuel company, you think, we'll just keep on paying hundreds of millions a year to distract and say that we're doing good things, then you are in a short lived position because you are aren't actually doing your fiduciary duty to, you know, to sail the ship in a direction that is sustainable for the shareholders. You're actually sailing it towards, you know, a cliff off the edge and, and for humanity. So I think there's a massive shift going to happen. I think it can happen quickly. I think the, everyone wants to be first to be second. So as soon as we see a major shift in one company, everybody will start because we love to follow. But let's get some leadership in the meantime. So there is one company that I know of that did did this kind of shift quite a long time ago. Um, it's called it's DSM, uh, based in the Netherlands. It's, it stands for Dutch State Mining. It's now one of yep. the leading life sciences company. Now, was that an easy transition? Of course not, but it, it was a transition that they undertook a long time ago because they decided it was the thing that made both business sense and moral sense. Um, what, whether we're going to see the same kind of thing in the fossil industry is going to be really interesting. But of course, there's this other side of this kind of transition given that the fossil fuel industry is such a large part of capital markets and it's such a large part of people's pension funds, mm-hmm. which gets back to the, the human development impacts of bringing about a transformation of the entire financial sector mm-hmm. on this short runway that we currently have. Um, one of the questions that keeps coming up, and, and I think all three of you have alluded to it, is that we don't really have very good standards for judging what it is that companies are doing. Governments don't really have good policies for what is it that companies ought to be doing. The metrics are terrible. The metrics for ESG are, a friend of mine in the industry said he went through 200 of the ESG metrics trying to find any that he could recommend to his clients to use, and he found 10 out of the 200. Um, so clearly this idea of reallocating capital using these kind of voluntary standards has, has certain limits. Are there things out there that we all ought to be doing? Are there targets in the SDGs? Are these notions of natural and social capital ways in which we should be investing? How do we do this? Great, and maybe I can come in. Uh, something I wanted to share. Um, so I think one aspect is the uh, carbon pricing. So we need in our world today a very definite carbon price curve. You know, this has been um, something that the world has recognized, but, you know, the prices remain, you know, $2, $5. Sometimes they go up to 30 or so. So I wanted to give an example. Uh, I won't name the agency, but let's say a multilateral issued $150 million uh, carb, um, forest bond. So the idea was the pension funds uh, buy these bonds um, and then they could get either cash for their coupon uh, or they could take carbon credits instead, carbon credit equivalent. And the uh, this agency was uh, um, sourcing the carbon credits from an uh, elephant corridor reforested in Kenya. And, and they had a mining company sitting there to take all the credits if nobody bought it. So unfortunately, in this case, none of the pension funds who invested in the bond chose the carbon credit for the coupon. They all took cash. And on asking the question why, the treasurers of uh, the treasuries of the pension fund said, "Look, there's no carbon curve. How do we, um, you know, buy and sell this uh, commodity, right? So we can't trade it easily. So we that's why we don't, you know. So it's still the world is still based on, uh, you know, certain financial mechanics on for profitability. So pricing carbon, uh, I think, is a vital um, aspect for the whole industry, and, and it includes a lot of the fossil fuel uh, companies uh, to contribute towards this." Uh, because what happens is beyond, you know, the ODA, the 150 billion that countries contribute to development, all the money sits with the pension funds, insurance funds, asset managers. That's where the trillions are. So to get them to invest in these things that can help uh, climate and nature uh, will be very important. So this risk perception, the risk perception of investing in these things uh, is very important. And in our work in the LDCs, uh, we have the same um, perspective and we want to create intermediary vehicles where you know, this money, where the money is, the pension funds, et cetera, the pools of capital, they want um, investment grade and they want liquid assets. And a lot of development assets uh, for human development are not investment grade, not liquid. So the idea would be to use an intermediary uh, rated, highly rated uh, company that would then issue bonds to to these uh, pension funds, the institutional money, and then um, give that money to an impact uh, fund who invest in in 
these kind of investment opportunities that we work with. So it and and why you would do that because a lot of that money is going into negative interest rate bonds, right? Uh, almost zero uh, percent. Banks are charging money for keeping the deposits. So this is risk. There is risk in the this development of uh, of the countries, but. You get three to five percent, and, uh, and that should be good enough. Uh, and we're also trying to obviously guarantee and risk mitigate all the other um, risks as much as you can. So those are some perspectives uh, as companies look at the future uh, and also investing their funds where they, they should think about um, those aspects. And then another session we could talk about uh, these nature performance bonds, which are as well nature performance bonds that now countries can issue and companies can buy, which uh, the debt is linked uh, to how well, the interest rate is linked to how well the country does on uh, nature-related uh, assets. And if it does well, then the interest rate falls. So those are some examples of uh, what uh, the market needs at the moment. I'll turn it back to you. And as you say, uh, we're, we're basically in the process of creating markets that have never existed before which means creating property rights. It means creating all the intermediaries, all the mechanisms. Um, we know that there currently is a voluntary market for carbon credits, which is not regulated. There are no standards. There are few standards. There are not sufficient metrics. One of the questions that comes up about if we're going to create these new kinds of markets in which companies like the automobile industry may want to invest because at some point they may be regulated on emissions that they are unable to control or for past emissions. How do we create markets? I mean, is the intermediaries approach the right way to do this? Um, how do we create markets that ensure that even upstream and downstream of the market itself, we keep the focus on actually solving the problems of the climate crisis and the nature crisis? How do you make sure that we don't end up with the equivalent of subprime mortgages? which we, we know that finance is a very complex field. It is very hard for um, for your ordinary investor and even for major firms to know as much as they need to know. And particularly when you're getting into areas where they have no expertise, like ecosystems and, and climate, how do you prevent fraud? How, how do you create a market that actually isn't just about making money? but is primarily about serving the public good of preserving nature and avoiding the climate crisis. Do we have ways of doing this? David, I think this is some of what you are working on as well. Sorry, just unmuting. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it all comes down to, um, you know, you have, you have to unlearn to relearn. We need transparency. We need accountability. We need clear markers, right? I mean, the example that was just presented is confidence, right? There's a, there's a confidence, like, well, how do we transition into this new capital market? How do we, this new language, right? Um, and if you have, you know, as you said, you're trying to connect various elements that aren't, um, necessarily, um, in, in, in the wheelhouse of a pension fund. So if you start talking about, you know, we'll take the value of oil that's in the ground and we'll leave it in the ground and we'll create a bond on that because it, you know, the, the, the nature systems, uh, around that, the value of that we can use in the future. And all of a sudden they're like, wait, wait, what, how, what's my return? And what, how does this work? And who's monitoring? And how do I know that there isn't a government change or a regime change and something changes? And then all of a sudden that, you know, so we do need these global, structures we do you know i mean for me we've got cop meeting at the end of the year in the uk trying to work closely now to get this carbon market to, to, to agree but i also go okay so we're going to agree on a carbon price and the time we agree on that carbon price maybe we'll be you know hopefully move to, to, to clean sustainable energy i mean because it's 26 years we sat around the table and just to be really not to be too much of a Debbie Downer, but we're still sitting around having a conversation about how much can we continue to pollute, right? And who's going to pay for that? And I'll pay because I have money and I can't pay because I don't have money. And I'm, well, if you give me a bit of money, then I'll turn the blind eye. And, you know, hopefully we'll see a shift. Hopefully we'll see change. But this is where I believe we need to see leadership actually coming from within side of, you know, it's a public private partnership for sure, but we do need that business leadership you know, take the automotive industry. If we wait for global consensus on how to transition to electrified or, you know, to, to a new form of mobility from governments all around the world and what they agree, 
I think we'll be sitting here. I mean, obviously, this is something that Bo could talk about probably more, but we'd probably be sitting here, you know, arguing about what's the right way for another 20, 30 years when you've seen a transition and you've seen statements from automotive makers saying we're going to go, you know, fully electrified by this date. That suddenly pushes, you know, the leadership's there. That suddenly pushes infrastructure in investment. So I do think we need to find trust in a new system. We need to find narratives that actually people understand that are transparent and accountable back to your conversation about all these ESG markets. Um, but, you know, we, we, I think we struggle with it. So, you know, I think we struggle with it for a number of reasons because everybody has a different vested interest. And, you know, there's that great saying, a camel is a horse designed by committee. And I feel that sometimes within inside of uh, this space, um, you know, inside of the environmental space, even with inside environmentalists, you know, we argue my way is better than your way. Why? Because I invested in the logo and an idea and a story. And so, you know, what we have to definitely try and do is, is make sure that we are not just believing what we're told up front, that there is more accountability, transparency, and we start and global consensus in areas where we can find it quickly. But if we spend another 10, 15, 20 years trying to figure out who's right, who's wrong, who's going to pay, who's not going to pay, um, then then we really have run out of runway um, because I think there is a very short period of time for this transition. Um, I think it's very interesting. Again, I go back to, you know, I think it was a Greta Thunberg who said in one of her quotes, she said, you know, um, if I ever needed any uh, real um, uh, evidence that we haven't actually been investing in climate change and in, in adaption is just looking at what we've done with COVID. And so the world rallied, you know, we've stuck trillions of dollars into the system, you know, rightfully so to protect lives, to mitigate this problem that's, you know, spread around the world. But when you look at the response we've had in the last year and you try and compare it to the response of climate change that we, we, we know is imminent and, and will cause way more damage, way more loss of life, way more issues, as we've mentioned. That, to me, I think is, is a pretty good sentiment to think about. We, we're not mobilizing at that speed. We're not investing the kind of money that we've just invested, you know, not even fractionally close. Right. We spend twenty six trillion dollars a year shopping. Right. Last year, we spent about 400 billion on clean energy. So put it into perspective. We, 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 you know, we're not adapting and it was actually less. It was about 300 billion on, on clean energy. So, well, clearly we are not moving at the pace that the, the various survival, <laughs> needed. survival needs and that humanity needs. Um, I believe we only have a couple of minutes left. So I would like to end with, um, am I correct in that or do we have a little more time? Um, because there were lots and lots of points in the in the comments, most of which were along the lines of, that's fascinating, great session. So people are very interested in hearing what you have to say. I would love to follow up at some point with all of you on how do those of us in academia, you know, I'm at the Thunderbird School of Global Management. We are very dedicated to this agenda. We are trying to create all sorts of training programs for everybody, not just for, for young students about how we make this transition. So love your help with that. But let me end with a question and give you each a minute or so to respond to this. Right. Where are we going to be in 2030? Um, well, let me start with you. Where is this industry going to be? First, I, I think that the 55% reduction in CO2 is realistic. Secondly, I always think it's important to highlight the people that are doing a good job. Uh, Norway, it's a bit strange for a Swedish guy to say Norway is doing great, but they decided as a government that they wanted to have electrification, even if they are an oil country. So if you buy an electrical vehicle in Norway, you get 20,000 euros, and it works because 50% of vehicles sold. So I'm an optimist. I, I think it's possible, uh, but I think more people need to be committed and even if I don't like consequences, if you don't follow the rules, there should be consequences. Thank you. Preeti, where are we going to be in 2030? Where is this all going to take us? So, Anne, what we need to work on is not having the greatest market failure of all times. So by 2030, if we don't achieve any degree of that SDG goals, that would be the biggest market failure, because in that sense, then capital would not have served humanity. 
So what I'd like to say, if you asked a question in the middle, uh, is there a lack of capital? No, there isn't. Because, for example, the PE industry has, private equity industry has $4 trillion. So it's not a failure. What we need to see, as I said, the shift in the mindset of the capital markets and things like I wanted to mention the task force on nature related financial disclosure that was just uh, formed and announced three days ago. So those things and some of the products I described, if we could.